Herzlich willkommen, hello and bonjour. Greetings to all listeners and welcome to the second episode of the third season of The New Germany. My name is Annika Weinreich and I would like to warmly welcome Katja Heuer and Oliver Moody, who are hosting this special podcast series as part of our History and Politics podcast. This episode focuses on the political relationship between Germany and France and the challenges the two neighboring countries have faced together in the past. We are very pleased to have Rim Montaz as our expert guest for this episode. She is a consultant research fellow for European foreign policy and security at the International Institute for Strategic Studies and a journalist. Welcome, dear Rim Montaz. But enough from me and on to you, Katja and Oliver. Let's get started. The Germans are behaving like pigs. They are putting themselves completely at the American service. They are betraying the spirit of the Franco-German Accord. And they are betraying Europe. Sacre bleu, Olivier! Have you been hitting the Chateau Neuf de Pop again? Not on my salary. But would you like to hazard a guess as to who did say those words? Mm. Was it Emmanuel Macron? You could definitely imagine them falling disdainfully from the lips of a disgruntled Elysee official today. But they were, in fact, uttered 60 years ago by none other than Charles de Gaulle. Today, we are at a critical juncture where the EU is preparing to expand to the east with as many as nine extra member states, one of which is currently at war with Russia. This big bang and the urgent imperative to beef up Europe's security means that many states are looking to Berlin and Paris for a sense of direction on the future of the continent. But right now, the Franco-German relationship is in what could only politely be described as a spot of bother. Traditionally, it's been described as the motor that drives Europe. But right now, France and Germany seem unable to agree whether it should be a Renault or a BMW, <laughs> let alone where it's going. A uh, Renault? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. But as that de Gaulle quote suggests... Post-war relations between France and Germany have seldom been straightforward. For all the sentimental moments in the fraternal photo album, think of de Gaulle embracing Adenauer after signing the 1963 Élysée Treaty, or Kohl and Mitterrand holding hands at the Verdun War Cemetery in 1984, or the Mercosy golden years of the early 2010s, The Franco-German engine is by its nature a fundamentally awkward contraption, powered as much by angst and amour propre as by amitié and abkommen. So, the central question today is this. Why do these old ways of resolving conflict seem to be breaking down today? And how could Macron and Scholz revive them? Welcome back to The New Germany, a special series from the Kerber Stiftung's History and Politics podcast. I'm Katja Hoyer, a German historian based in Britain. And I'm Oliver Moody, a British journalist in Berlin. If you have tuned into this episode expecting the sort of cheap, cheese-eating, surrender monkey-based humour you get on The Rest is History, Ooh. I'm afraid you've come to the wrong place. The New Germany is a respectable and serious-minded podcast, so there will be no Gallic shrugs, there will be no cod French accents, and above all, there will be no use of the word Buff. Oh, come on. Can't we do at least one joke? One. But only if it's a German joke. <clears throat> Fine. Why do all the European power transmission routes run through France? I don't know, Ketcher. Why do all the European power transmission routes run through France? Because electricity always takes the path of least resistance. Right. Glad you got that out of your system. <laughs> But it's not actually a, a bad segue into the um, current tensions between France and Germany, because electricity has been one of the big areas of disagreement, and specifically whether the vast fleet of atomic reactors that provide two-thirds of France's power should be treated as clean energy and so eligible for green subsidies. And yet, when you look at the list of these policy disputes, as we will do in more detail in a little while with our expert guest, none of them on the face of it seems big enough to fully explain the bitterness and dysfunctionality of the relationship right now. I think there's a good case for taking a look back over what's happened between the countries since the Second World War, not just to put these squabbles in proportion, but also to understand how conflict resolution worked in the past and why the Germans have set so much store by their ties to Paris. 
So how did they establish any kind of meaningful cooperation in the first place after everything that Nazi Germany had done to France before 1945? Yeah, I mean, it's it's not. It certainly wasn't easy because it's, it wasn't just Nazi Germany. Although, of course, that was the pinnacle of the, of the uh, you know really really uh, acrimonious relationship, to put it mildly, between Germany and France. But you could go back really to you know all the way to the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, to look at, at this kind of constant back and forth between Germany and France, um, and certainly the last three wars before that. So that's the Franco-Prussian War that unified Germany uh, in 1871, and then the First World War and the Second World War um, were all kind of uh, one-way traffic, really, where the aggression came from Germany towards France. And so there was really a sense, you know, how can this be avoided? Because by that point, this this so called Erbfeindschaft or like hereditary um you know enmity between the two countries seem to be so entrenched you know well over a century's worth of it that it's it's quite uh difficult to see in in nineteen forty five how you can come back from that and so you know both countries felt that especially with you know the huge amount of atrocities that were committed during the the second world war. Um, that they needed to find a way through, you know, treaties, a lot of goodwill, um, economic cooperation to to get away from this pattern um, that had been so entrenched before. And so really what happened was that the first West German Chancellor, Konrad Adenauer, uh, tried to make it basically clear that he was now leading a Western country, one that would be um, incorporated within you know, a, a kind of network of countries that all share the same values to which France also belonged. Um, uh, but particular attention was also paid to France um, by by Germany. So it wasn't kind of just a, a wide the so-called Westbindung or, or Western orientation, but particularly, um, you know, the, the French were to be brought on board with this whole idea. Um, and so one of the early attempts to do exactly that is the Treaty of Paris of 1951, which established the European coal and steel community. And so the idea was basically that if you bind the industries of Germany and France together in areas that are needed for warfare, so namely, you know, coal and steel, that it makes it impossible for the two countries to go to war with one another because they're so reliant on each other's resources and that it would basically be yeah impossible or certainly difficult. Um, and so this is kind of one of the early, early ideas is that you just share and, and make one another so reliant on on each other's resources that it's impossible to to go back to the state of of kind of war um, that that they were in pretty much permanently before that. The idea was then to be taken further. So in 1954, there was supposed to be a European defence a community agreement. So this was um, an agreement signed between um, the Benelux countries, um, Italy and West Germany and France was supposed to be in it as well. And the idea was that this would create a unified defence force, which was supposed to be a, a kind of separate part of NATO um, within NATO, but kind of a, a different uh, pillar that, that could be based in Europe. Um, the problem was that the French assembly wouldn't ratify it. Basically, they feared that this would lose them their their national sovereignty, if you will. So the the idea of a of a common army together with the Germans wasn't quite acceptable yet to the to the French um, National Assembly. Um, so you can see basically this idea of of working together in perpetuity is already um, beginning to uh, to to show cracks then. And then in 1957, you got the Treaty of Rome, which is widely kind of regarded as one of the founding treaties of, of what is now the European Union. Uh, so the idea behind that was basically economic cooperation. So make the the European countries work as one economy. So this would mean sort of things like uh, reducing customs duties over time, um, establishing a customs union in the end, uh, creating a single market. So all the things that make the European Union today uh, were kind of founded then, and, and this is of course really important. Um, once again, to shackle the two economies together uh, means that it makes it difficult for kind of this enmity to resume. And then in 1963, you get the uh, Elysee Treaty, which was again supposed to be a, a kind of treaty of friendship between France and West Germany, where they pledged uh, between Charles de Gaulle, the, the president, and and the West German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer that the the two countries would in the future. Uh, sort of work together and find a, a common base to work together. 
the problem was that initially it didn't mention anything about Britain or the US um, in it. And Germany was quite um, keen to basically not offend the United States with that. And when they took offense with it, uh, the Bundestag, the German parliament, um, basically added a, a kind of preamble to the treaty uh, which incorporated the United States, um, which then meant that the whole point of it, as Charles de Gaulle had seen it, namely to kind of provide a counterbalance to the US uh, in Europe, uh, was sort of gone with that. And it's in that context that the Gaulle said that quote that you you so beautifully um, recited earlier, uh, adding later actually in 1965 that the Germans had been my greatest hope, but now they are my greatest disappointment. Um, so this really did put a spanner in the works of of uh, German French relations. While you, while you were giving that fantastic overview of the first sort of two decades after the war, I, I found myself wondering. How you would say Erbfeindschaft in French. And um, the best I could come up with was inimitié héréditaire, which sounds like something that requires the, the services of a specialist doctor. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not even sure it is as much of a con you know, of a concept on the other side. I think it's something the Germans are now so like angsty about and anxious about that it's it's more of a concept, I would say, on on their side than it is on the French. It it is quite an asymmetric relationship culture in a lot of ways, as I think we'll probably come back to a bit later in the podcast. But for now, while we're on this extremely important formative period between de Gaulle and Adenauer, they obviously saw the world in very different ways and they were not the kind of leaders who would in any way neglect their national interests, to put it mildly. Um, you have talked about how some of those interests, especially in a, a kind of economic or raw material sense, were entangled. But can you say a bit more about how you think they were able to work together despite all of these things where they were very much not in alignment? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's two different dynamics going on here, isn't there? So on the one hand side, um, they overlap because the Gaulle is basically keen to establish French power in Europe again. And he sees Germany as a partner in that, you know, in the context of the Cold War, where you have those two great superpowers, de Gaulle basically thinks that there can be a third, uh, you know, kind of pole of power, if you will, and that's Europe, and he needs Germany for that. Um, and Adenauer's interests overlap with that to some extent, because if you know France is on um, on side, then he can start rebuilding a military, which of course you know would have been unthinkable in the forties, late forties after the uh, the the Second World War had only just um, you know been over. So I think it's that's that's where they overlap. Um, this kind of idea that if they work together within Europe, both Germany and France get get something out of it. But I think where they differ is that Adenauer knows he also needs the US as a really strong partner in, in order to do all of these things. Um, and that's exactly contrary to what the goal wants. So when Adenauer is saying, no, Germany needs to be part of the West, it also needs to be part of the American, you know, sort of umbrella, if you will, and then therefore needs to shackle itself to, to American interests. And that's exactly what the goal is trying to avoid. So I think they can only really work together where those interests overlap and that is in strengthening their European position. But Germany, West Germany is always looking to America at the same time. And that's where, where they clash. And the, the next really big inflection point in the Franco-German relationship is in the, the 1980s and the 1990s, particularly under François Mitterrand and Helmut Kohl. What, what were the big things that changed from, from your perspective in that period? I think personnel is one thing. You know, you've got Helmut Kohl and, and Mitterrand as, as kind of a generation that, yes, they've, they've still um, experienced the... The, the Second World War, but not in the way that Adenauer um, and de Gaulle did. They, you know, they weren't sort of adults and involved in 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 the conflict in the same way. And so I think it's it's a bit easier to move away from from that, you know, shock and from the impressions and from the formative elements that, that you know that this huge conflict brought with it. So they they are just a new younger younger generation, um, and for them you know, kind of big gestures came a bit more easily, I would say. So, you know, you obviously have this famous moment at Verdun where they go back uh, to one of the sort of bloodiest battles really between Germany and France um, in 1916, the Battle of Verdun. They go to that site uh, in 1984 uh, together 
you know, which is quite a sort of symbolic uh, moment to say that they want to move away from these uh, from these conflicts um, and and find a kind of new ground of of working together. Um, you get lots of cooperation at that point. Um, you know, kind of the idea that that the modern EU and the eurozone is founded in that period, um, and and kind of national interests should be left behind um, in order to find a, a common ground as a European. Uh, you know, kind of European bloc, really, as a, as a counterpoint again to the to the US at this stage, uh, and I think reunification, the reunification of Germany in 1990, brings a new dimension to that, because with that sort of two different um, uh, kind of principles came into play. So on the one hand side, you know, the fact that the Soviet Union is collapsing means that you have a bit less of of, of an emphasis there that Europe needs to be a third pole. Um, but on the flip side, Germany also knows that it needs the US and, and its support in order to actually do reunification, particularly as there's so much animosity towards it in Europe from Britain, for example. Um, so in a way, it kind of strengthens both of these dynamics that we talked about before. You know, the idea of a, of a stronger Europe together is there. But on the flip side, it also means that Germany is still incredibly reliant on the US um, in order to get this done. And so both those Kind of the, the working together and the problems that come with that are, are kind of amplified by reunification. Um, but the last time the Franco-German motor really fired at full throttle was in the Merkel era, I'd say. Um, was Merkel Z all it's cracked up to be, Oliver? I'm not. Oh, I'm not really sure what portmanteau you would you would use for Merkel and Hollande. Like maybe Merkel Hollande or something like that. Well, yes, yeah, some of the the newspapers at the time did try to make uh, Merkel happen, but it didn't really stick. And and personally, I think it was a missed opportunity to use the term Angsoir. <laughs> um and. In the course of the research for this segment, I have come across so many pictures of Merkel and Sarkozy in various intimate embraces that I think I'm going to have to bill our friends at the Kerber Stiftung for the resulting therapy sessions. <laughs> yeah, hard to get that back out of your mind. <laughs> <laughs> it, it certainly wasn't love at first sight, though. Um, Sarkozy actually campaigned for the French presidency in 2007 with a promise to pull France away from Germany and form more of an axis with Spain and, and other Southern European states. And there's, um, there's this lovely but, but possibly apocryphal story that Merkel um, prepared for their first meeting by watching these old comedy films with the, um, the actor Louis de Funès. Um, it's a French, French actor very known, but or best known really for pulling silly faces. Um, and there are some reports that even suggest that Sarkozy used to refer to Merkel as um, la grosse, uh, the fat <laughs> one. And it was only really with the Deauville summit of 2010 where um, the two leaders thrashed out a compromise deal to to restructure the debt of some of the sicklier states in the Eurozone that the, the relationship got going. And in the end, I think you can make a case that it genuinely made a meaningful contribution to Sarkozy's political downfall a couple of years later as he was touting le modèle allemand, the, the German economic model, to the French electorate. And the French electorate pretty much turned up its nose and said, non merci. As for Hollande, there was certainly a certain froideur to begin with, but on the whole, they established a fairly businesslike working relationship on the big issues of the day. You think about the, the tail end of the Eurozone crisis or the Normandy format negotiations after the first Russian invasion of Ukraine. And that tells you something about Merkel's professionalism, at least in terms of the lengths she would go to to forge personal connections with her partners. But also, I think about the deeply ingrained belief that still existed in the French and German establishments back then that the axis had to be made to work one way or another. Well, I think if there's one sort of common strand here, you know, looking throughout this this entire history that we just briefly uh, went through, it's probably this kind of theme that Germany's really deep attachment to reconciliation with France is the key to unlocking its absolution on a on a world scale, really, on a, on an international stage, and I think that's often um, I think underestimated when you look at it from the outside how important that is to the German psyche still to the way that. Germany deals with its own past, you know, this whole concept of Vergangenheitsbewältigung, like the, the idea of overcoming one's past, I think comes into that again, where Germany does need to show that it's friends with France in perpetuity now, 
in order to say that it's kind of dealt with this entire World War II um, history and, and this kind of French element is so central to that, that, you know, Germany tries to sort of keep working on that, even though the realities, as we'll um, presumably see in a moment when we when we have our conversation with our expert guest, um, is moving in a different direction. And those two um, sort of clash, you know, the very real political and, and uh, economic divergences between um, the interests of, of Germany and France are sort of one side of it. And then Germany's desire to to bridge those anyway is, is there at the same time. And I'm, I'm not sure that's going to work you know, in perpetuity for the next sort of few decades, that 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 will kind of to be friends will will be stronger than uh, the fact that they want different things out of this relationship. Yeah. So our expert witness Rim will be able to say a great deal about how it looks from Paris's perspective. I can say a bit about how it looks from Berlin's perspective now, which is very very mixed and in some ways quite hard to read. Um. So on the one hand, you you still have all the formal trappings of the old days. So if you think back to the months before the 2021 Bundestag election, for example, when uh, each of the three candidates for the German Chancellery made this kind of ceremonial trek over to Paris for their audition with Macron in the hope of winning a bit more credibility in the eyes of German voters. And um, it's also interesting to note that by the time this episode goes out, Macron will also have received Friedrich Merz, the, the leader of the CDU opposition. And there are definitely political leaders in Germany who still take this emotional connection that you just described very seriously. Um, a few months back, I interviewed Anna Luhrmann, the, the Green Party Europe minister. And it was just after the, the latest film adaptation of All Quiet on the Western Front had come out. And she said that that film had had kind of once again driven home to her just how terrible things could be when the Franco-German relationship misfires. But, and and this is a a significant but, a number of sources in Berlin have told me that for various reasons the Schultz Chancellery just doesn't see Paris as a priority in the way that Merkel did. And at the same time, the balance of power in Europe has shifted in France's favour over the past few years, since the end of the Eurozone crisis and particularly since February 2022, Germany's no longer in the driving seat to the extent that it was. And instead, it's Macron who's been taking the initiative. So all these disputes, which might individually have been quite soluble with a bit of goodwill, have just piled up and become overwhelming. And right now, there's no obvious willingness on either side to fix them. The One of the constants that has kept coming up in this conversation has been the ebb and flow of tension between these German Atlanticist tendencies and France's various visions of a more independent and, and dare I say, quite French-flavoured Europe, um, of which Macron's strategic autonomy or strategic sovereignty doctrines are, are kind of the latest iteration Katja, what do you see as the, the common elements between the, the De Gaulle's and the, the Mitterrand's and the Macron's on this question? Yeah, I think it's exactly that. The idea that um, Europe is is sort of an extension, really, of, of French power. Um, and I think people found that quite difficult once um, or whilst Angela Merkel was in power, um, you know, to sort of get get past that same actually with with call before or Adenauer, you know, those really towering figures that you can't really get past. Uh, I found it quite interesting that there was certainly an element, you know, when Angela Merkel left and and Olaf Scholz came in that, you know, you kind of saw Macron's eyes light up and the idea that there was now going to be a a void, you know, while Scholz was trying to establish himself um, for the French to step into. Um, And I think that that's always clashed, I think, hugely with um, Germany's idea of Yes, doing that to some extent as well, but doing it in lockstep with the Americans. And that's, I think, the, the big clash that they can't really get past. But I think for, for the French to sort of wait for a German leader that isn't um, as uh, 
domineering basically on the world stage as, as some of them have been and not as long lived as well. I mean, that's always their problem as well, isn't it? When you have a German chancellor in for 16 years, <laughs> that they have time to establish relationships, to build a reputation, to have something kind of statesman-like about them that is easier to establish over time than it is in in one or two terms in the in the case of the French. And I think they sort of felt, you know, Macron certainly felt that, that now was the time to to shift that back to him and to to a more European-based um, version of the of the Franco-German alliance. I suppose really we should come back to this after 16 years of Schultz to do a, a fair comparison. <laughs> I just want to say a little bit more about the war in Ukraine because I do think it has exposed and widened a certain strategic divide between Berlin and Paris, um, there are some observers who will argue that the Zeitenwender is actually more real in France than it is in Germany. Um, one example they would cite would be defence spending, uh, because while I'm sure pretty much all of our listeners will know that Schultz announced his 100 billion euro Bundeswehr rearmament fund a few days after the start of the invasion, some of them may not know that Macron has added 118 billion euros to the next round of the French military budget from 2025. Um, and we've also seen France, despite traditionally being a lot more sceptical of EU enlargement than, than Germany has been, um, being quicker on the uptake once Ursula von der Leyen and the Central and Eastern European states started to advocate for Ukraine to join the bloc. Um, and it being Macron who was the first to kind of unblock that path before Schultz followed suit. It was Macron who founded the, the European political community, um, with, which the Germans were initially very sniffy about. And it was Macron who got the ball rolling on the great tank dispute of early 2023, uh, when Germany is under really intense international pressure to send Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine. And um, France comes out of the blocks first and says it will send over a consignment of AMX-10 RCs, uh, which are not quite sort of full fat battle tanks, but are kind of charmingly referred to as char léger or light tanks. And this is the first time anyone had given the Ukrainians more than Western armoured fighting vehicles. And then, of course, the Brits said they would donate a squadron of Challenger 2s and the Americans finally promised um, to send some of their M1 Abrams and that was eventually what unlocked the Leopard deal. I do think there is a tendency to overcook this thesis of Macron as the, the hairy-chested saviour of Europe, if I'm honest, because at the end of the day, Germany has been by far the biggest material supporter of Ukraine after the US. It's pledged or delivered well over 18 billion euros of military equipment alone. We don't actually know for sure how much kit the French have given because they're quite secretive about it. But the most generous estimate, which, Katia, you will be astonished to hear, comes from the French Parliament, is that it's given about 3.2 billion euros of kit, which is less than Norway's contribution. And the most widely quoted figure is 533 million euros, which is less than Slovakia has given. It's still more than 5,000 helmets. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think it's maybe time to bring in um, our expert guest who can tell us a little bit more about the, the French side of things and exactly how many hairs are on uh, Macron's chest. Um, <laughs> Because our guest knows the Elysee about as well as any outside observer might do. Our expert witness today is Reem Momtaz, one of the sharpest and best informed Macron splainers in the business. Reem grew up in Lebanon and has approached the subject from just about every conceivable angle, first as an assistant to the Lebanese delegation on the UN Security Council, then as an outstanding France correspondent for Politico during the early years of the Emmanuel Macron era, and now as a think tanker and analyst with the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Reem, welcome to the New Germany podcast. Thank you for having me. It's such an honor. Let's go straight into the personal relationship between Emmanuel Macron and Olaf Scholz. One German foreign policy analyst recently described it in a book as a political telenovela. How would you describe it? And how much does it matter in the grand scheme of things for the functionality of the broader Franco-German relationship? Yeah, I like I like the telenovela 
way of, of describing it because I think it gets to the heart of the drama that has characterized this uh, sort of relationship since the beginning of Olaf Scholz's term as chancellor. It also, I think, captures so much of the sort of passion at the heart of it, so much of the unrequited, I'm not going to say love, but, you know, attempts at working together, at cooperating. They just seem to be, you know, two ships at sea, right? Always, always at odds, never actually sort of always... They seem to be basically two ships passing each other at sea, always, constantly, always out of sync, quite dysfunctional, uh, to the point that, I mean, I was really struck by this. The new Finnish prime minister a few months ago kind of said publicly that, you know, they had never seen such a lack of coordination between France and Germany. That's stark for a fellow, you know, counterpart leader to say it so bluntly. So it's clear to everyone that the relationship isn't working and that they haven't been able to find a working MO, a modus operandi, that can get the compromises needed and that can even lead to some sort of at least one common project. They haven't even figured that out yet. And why do you think is that? So why, what are the biggest specific areas of disagreement between France and Germany at the moment? So I think there are two parts to this question. The first is, there is real difficulty between the two leaders on a personal level. They just don't get along. And, you know, we've all been in that kind of situation, having to have a co-worker, because essentially at their level, they are co-workers within the EU, that we have to work with, but that we don't get along with, with whom we don't share any kind of, you know, uh, commonality of view. We don't have the same sense of humor. We don't have the same approach to working. We don't have the same method of working. And that is the case between Schultz and and Macron. And so far, they haven't been able to to find at least one way to fix that sort of personal relationship. So the personal relationship is very cold and it doesn't help. And that's something that is essential, by the way, in, in foreign affairs, but also in politics generally. And I think it's a dimension that is usually maybe underappreciated, how important it is for personalities to get along. So that's the first thing. The second thing is there is a long list of issues right now on which they can't seem not only to see eye to eye, but they can't seem to figure out even the start of a compromise. And all of these issues, they're not necessarily new, but they are. they have a new sense of urgency in the current context. They're all kind of coming to a head at the same time. So in broad strokes, there are major differences on industrial policy. And on industrial policy, it's both the idea, you know, Macron's idea of strategic autonomy, what that means in terms of onshoring, friendshoring, versus Germany being much more comfortable relying on the US or even, you know, buying things from outside of you, especially when it comes to defense. And I'll get back to that in a bit. But there's also the part about related to energy and energy sources in the EU. Of course, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Russian gas has become a big no-no, which has actually been a very important part of the German industrial strategy. Whereas the French have relied in a massive way on their nuclear power plants. And as you know, Germany is against nuclear power and has reverted in some ways to generating energy from coal. So that has become a huge problem between France and Germany, because on top of that, so the green dimension of how do you generate energy that is sustainable, that is sovereign, so it doesn't depend on an external provider, but also that is green and as cheap as possible. There is the question of the common sort of European electric tariff, let's call it, right? The price of, of electricity. And that has become another big issue because France wants its nuclear generation to be part of it and Germany doesn't want it. Just keep things a bit, a bit simple. Then there's the whole question of defense per se. So Germany has launched this new air defense initiative 
and the Sky Shield initiative, that didn't sit well at all with France because the European Sky Shield initiative as launched by Germany would rely on US and Israeli systems and not, for example, on the Franco-Italian system. So that was the first thing that France didn't like. But more importantly, what it doesn't like is that, according to Paris, it doesn't actually integrate the dimension of the French nuclear deterrence, which, as you know, is a massive component and pillar of French approach to defense. There are also huge differences when it comes to st the Stability and Growth Pact of the EU. So the Stability and Growth Pact, just to sort of summarize it, you know, it has to do with sort of the rules of uh, government spending within the EU and the acceptable levels of debt and deficit. That was suspended during COVID. It's supposed to come back into effect in 2024. And the sort of conversation about how to get it back into effect and what it should look like have been stuck basically since October. So that's, that's a big one. And finally, perhaps, I will stop at the other component of industrial policy, which is the relationship with China. Uh, it's not that they're completely at odds. I think on China, there's a little more overlap than meets the eye. But for example, when the EU launched its probe into electric vehicles in China, Germany was quite unhappy with it, whereas France was cool with it. And that, you know, again, goes to the heart of main difference. So strategic autonomy on the one hand, in France and on the other, you know, change through trade, if, if, I, if I were to summarize it on the German side, which, you know, continues to want to keep the relationship with China going, the trade level that is, I think, more involved than even France is, is comfortable with. And I'll stop there. It's already a very long, very hard list of, of disagreements. It, it is extraordinary how they, how they have piled up. Um, I'd like to talk about the, the attitude with which officials on both sides are approaching these questions. Because when you talk to people in the German government today, there's a really interesting division between those, particularly in Olaf Scholz's chancellery, who tend to regard it as a series of conflicting interests and mostly failed transactions, on the one hand, and on the other hand, those who um, still regard the Franco-German relationship in quite emotional terms on some level in the context of Germany's long struggle to overcome its burden of guilt for the Third Reich and regard reconciliation with France as the, the key to unlocking that. So I'd be really interested to hear how their French opposite numbers look at the relationship and whether there's any corresponding sense of historical or, or sentimental importance. So to start with, I've always been struck by the, the difference in the way the French and the Germans talk about their relationship and the words that they ascribe to that relationship. The Germans talk about the Franco-German engine, right? It's a very rational mathematical, mechanical way of looking at it, an engine. Whereas the French, when they talk about it, they say le couple franco-allemand, the Franco-German couple. It's a much more emotional, passionate way of looking at it. And I think, you know, that actually betrays a fundamental difference in the approach, not to over-romanticize it or not to sort of ascribe it too much more, more importance than it than it has. I do think that words matter. They, they, you know, just like language betrays a certain sort of approach and and logic, words also do. So that's the first thing that really strikes me. I think a part of the French establishment, of course, is understands the importance and the centrality of the Franco-German entente, ability to compromise, ability to build projects together for what, you know, post-World War II Europe was and became. So the reconciliation project, getting over all of the bloody history, that is definitely sort of a dimension, of course. But in the day-to-day, -day, the issue 
the aspect that has really struck me over the past, I would say, 18 months is just how broken those lines of communication have become and just how uh, prevalent suspicion is on both sides. So both sides now have a very high level of suspicion toward the other. On the German side, the, what I detect is a sense that with the Zeitwende, Germany kind of coming into its own, emerging from its, you know, decades long post World War II, let's say, withdrawn role when it comes to defense issues and strategic issues, and now emerging and wanting to step up and to have a bigger role. So throwing, you know, the thing that it has most of, which is money and industrial power at this issue. That has destabilized the relationship, in truth, because the relationship has always relied on kind of a tenuous balance that was built on an understanding and an acceptance that Germany would be sort of the industrial financial powerhouse and France is the military strategic powerhouse. And in Paris, there is a feeling, even though I think very few officials will say this on the record or even admit it explicitly, there is a feeling that Germany is starting to encroach on, you know, their reserve domain, which is strategic and military issues. And of course, the Parisian view is that Berlin doesn't have strategic culture that is developed enough yet, and also has an approach to strategic issues that is really at odds with the French issue, as we were discussing when it comes to sort of strategic autonomy, the relationship with the U.S., and 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 all of that, and also the relationship to the nuclear deterrent. So I think fundamentally, between the different ways of describing the relationship, but also the suspicion that now exists where, you know, some officials in France have been sort of saying that Germany is trying to make sure that France never gets an industrial advantage, or that Germany is trying to undermine France's strategic advantage when it comes to its nuclear deterrent. I mean, these are very serious accusations that betray not only a lack of trust and suspicion, but like very fundamental dysfunction. And I think it's going to be very hard to get over it. I mean, they keep trying to paper things over by, you know, you see various officials making all these statements about how you know, the French and the Germans may not agree, but when they agree, they are the fundamental power within the EU, and that's what it keeps it going. And of course, it's normal that they don't agree, and there's always been these differences. But honestly, the terms of the conversation, I think, are quite striking. And I think we haven't heard these terms of the conversation in a couple of decades. I'm not saying that it's, you know, unprecedented. I am very aware of the fact that right after World War II, of course, the conversations were very, very, very difficult and more difficult than they are today. But we shouldn't underestimate just how much of a crisis the relationship is in right now and has been for more than a year. So I think it's probably fair to say then that the Franco-German engine or the motor is uh, stuttering and continues to experience mechanical problems. What does that then mean for the balance of power in Europe? So what opportunities does this maybe open up for other states such, such as Poland? And what's France's plan B, especially with regard to Central and Eastern Europe? So I think that's a fundamental question. And I th actually think that that's a question that is adding to the dysfunction and the tension between the two countries. It's, you know, with that suspicion that I was talking about, the distrust. So they're each sort of looking at each other across the Rhine thinking, you know, how is the other going to try to double cross me? And of course, Poland, it's an interesting case because I think Poland is trying to play the role that the UK used to play when the UK used to be in the EU with the triangulation, you know, whether that is going to succeed is honestly still a very, very open question. Certainly, we have seen French attempts at at least trying to get closer to Poland on the defense levels when it comes to defense projects and the approach to Ukraine, even though that relationship is extremely fraught, as we know. And it is fraught, not just, you know, since sort of the Iraq war to go back there. But even 
it's fraught because of things that Macron himself has done. I don't want to dredge up all of the past, but, you know, his overtures to Putin with Prégançon in 2019 and everything else that followed, but also some of the things that he said at the beginning of the war in Ukraine, you know, calling basically Poland warmongers. He has tried to kind of backpedal on that with his speech in Bratislava, but, you know, the distrust is still there. So that is there, but they are trying to work on something that is more constructive now, France and Poland. The relationship, obviously, between Poland and Germany has known better times, to use a euphemism. It has been quite quite tense with Polish, you know, requests for payments and, and uh, sort of reparations coming up again. It's going to be very important to see how the new Polish prime minister, Donald Tusk, you know, manages that relationship, whether he is able to reset the relationship with Germany, which is something obviously that is expected of him, and how that new dynamic is going to affect also the dynamic with with France. So that is sort of the the Polish, German, French triangle, better known as the Weimar triangle. We'll see if that triangle is actually going to be revived, even as a trilateral format in addition to kind of that first dynamic that I was talking about. And then when it comes to France and its plan B, I wouldn't put it in terms of plan B, meaning an alternative to the relationship with Germany. I think both Berlin and Paris understand that it is a central relationship that if it remains this dysfunctional, will keep the EU very dysfunctional. So they have to find a way at least to find a way forward on some of the issues that are EU-focused. So, for example, the Stability and Growth Pact, the electricity thing. When it comes to bilateral things, maybe they can sort of take a little longer to, to figure them out. But it is true that you see both countries try to deepen their relationships with other parts of the EU. So I was talking, for example, about the the German Sky Shield initiative. They've built that with the participation at least a dozen other EU member states. That's an interesting approach by Germany, something that France used to do very well and now that Germany is doing more and more. And France is obviously has been, at least for the past six, seven months, on a real charm offensive when it comes to the Baltic states, when it comes to Central Europe, when it comes to Eastern Europe, trying to recover from, you know, those things that Macron did with Russia and at the beginning of the Ukraine, this Ukraine invasion of 2022, to try to kind of recover from that. So both are clearly trying to hedge and expand their basis of, let's say, coalition within the EU. But I don't think they perceive these as alternatives to their relationship. So, you know, that remains the central relationship. I'd like to ask about one specific issue that feels to me like the Gordian knot, where so many of these problems we've been talking about get tangled up in each other. And that is these two very costly projects to develop next generation air and ground combat systems that are supposed to become the European military standard from, you know, maybe the 2040s on. It's no secret that this has been quite a laborious process, to put it mildly. What has been going wrong here? And what do these difficulties tell us about the broader problems in the relationship? Yeah, I mean, you put, you put your finger on it. These these two projects just feel like, you know, two huge boulders that both countries keep trying to sort of push up a hill and it keeps, you know, almost crushing them and, and going back backwards. It's It's truly, it's a very tough time for both, I think, projects. So fundamentally... It is the clash of two very different systems, you know, which is, as as you can now see, kind of a central theme, right, of of this relationship. So first of all, the two countries don't have the same approach. Basically, the two states, the two governments don't have the same approach and relationship with their industries. Let's start there, right? France is a much more sort of centralized, top-down place where 
basically the government and the state is the one that uh, not dictates, but really gives direction to the defense industry on what it needs, what are the priorities, and then the production kind of follows because the French state is extremely involved in both obviously consuming what the French defense industry produces, but also in exporting it and making sure that it is sold. And it is the basis of strategic partnerships with countries. France has these strategic partnerships that are basically military strategic partnerships with countries like the UAE, like Greece, like India. That is not something that Germany has in that way. And in fact, if anything, the relationship is actually upside down or exactly the opposite, let's say, than in France, where it is the French-German industrialists that kind of tell the government and the state what it is that they are working on, and then they figure things out. Also, just in terms of how the relationship works, the French have something called the DGA, Direction Générale de l'Armement, General Directorate of Armament, that is kind of a centralizing, clearing house where, you know, the government and the industrialists sort of can talk. That is not something that is that exists exactly the same way in Germany. And that has made these two projects for the fighter jet and the tank of the future even more difficult. So that's one thing that has been very difficult to get over, actually has required political intervention at various points where basically the ministers or even the president and the chancellor, whoever these were, so this is also basically in the time of Merkel, to intervene and say to the industrialists, listen, you need to get over this and this is what we're going to do and let's, let's keep going. The other part is an industrial mismatch, right? So Germany has an industrial advantage when it comes to the tanks and France has an industrial advantage when it comes to fighter jets. And the way the projects are staffed requires sort of 50-50 representation at every level, which doesn't necessarily mean that you are harnessing the best competences on whatever specific component of each of the projects is by, you know, picking whether it's the whether it's France or Germany that has the most competent, you know, let's say company for that stage of the production process. That has led to issues in, in the process. And finally, there is a big difference in the outlook, which is that, you know, France is very adamant about being able to export these projects to any and all countries that might want to buy them, because they think of it as obviously, you know, an economic project. Germany is much more reticent. We're seeing it right now, for example, with the Saudi request for Eurofighters, Germany has issues with Saudi Arabia's human rights record and doesn't want the export to go through. So this is a very important dimension when you were building, you know, generations long industrial projects together. So all of this to say that right now, both projects don't seem to be in, in good shape. But neither side politically, I think, so far is prepared to recognize that they want to kind of end these projects. Neither side wants to come out and say, we're calling time on this. Let's move on to plan Bs. But the industrialists, so the companies in both countries are looking at plan Bs just in case this doesn't work. Because, of course, it's their job to do that, right? To always have sort of solutions. So, yeah, it's not in a, we're not in a good place right now, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the end of these projects. It's just, again, symptomatic of just difficulty and the dysfunction that the relationship is experiencing right now. What a note to end on. But, Reem, it has been a pleasure and an education. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. And uh, if listeners would like to read more of your analysis, where is the best place for them to look? And have you got any other reading recommendations on the topic? Well, so right now, actually, I'm working on a very long project that is taking up all my time on sort of strategic competition, Eastern Mediterranean, which we will be publishing with the IISS 
by March or April of 2024. So that's the next big thing, but always go on double and you know, you'll see my blog posts and of course, Twitter. I'm always there sort of trying as hard as I can to keep sane and try to contribute to that conversation. Yeah, that's, that's what I would uh, recommend. And thank you so very much. I think this has been, you know, quite an important and an interesting conversation. So I thank you for inviting me. Thank you. I completely agree. And thanks for your, for, thanks for your insights. And thank you also, as always, to the Körber Stiftung for their generosity, foresight and good taste, of course, in hosting this podcast. <laughs> Even if Oliver's um, distinctive sense of humor does sometimes jeopardize the latter. Um, you can find a wealth of other episodes in both German and English on the Arctic, history in video games, traditions of climate protest and plenty of other subjects if you simply search for Körber Stiftung History and Politics wherever you get your podcasts. If listeners have any thoughts they would like to air on the Franco-German relationship, you know where to find us. Just go to the website formerly known as Twitter, punch in at Rim Montaz, at Hoya underscore Cat, or at Oliver and Moody and fire away. And Katya, congratulations on getting through an entire 50 minutes of talking about France and Germany without once mentioning the Franco-Prussian War. Well, I have to make up for that now. I'm off to paint my metal figurines of Bismarck's Third Army. But farewell from Norfolk. And I should go back to trying to exercise all of those pictures of Merkel and Sarkozy from my hippocampus before they're branded into my memory forever. Tschüss aus Berlin. <laughs> <laughs>